Well, good morning. The sermon title for today is Prophets. We've been doing this deep dive into Scripture and walking through, um, really, I, I've been saying to Alder, man, we're reading a lot of Scripture. Um, amen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I want us to understand why we're doing that, partially here, particularly because these three scriptures may not seem connected to you. But we have talked about the journey of the people of Israel. We've looked at, at really even into captivity and exile. We talked about resident aliens and the call for us to live as resident aliens. And I wanted to end this series with these words, the words of the prophets. Now, what is a prophet? We think of a prophet as a fortune teller. That's what we think a lot of times. There's somebody that tells the future. Let me prophesy about, hold on a second, let me prophesy about the future. I, hold on, I'm getting a word. I'm so sorry. Alabama's going to go five and six. I'm not. Right. Right. That's we. That's so, yeah. That's what we think a prophet is, but that is not at all what a prophet is. A prophet does not foretell anything. A prophet forth tells the word of God. Look at somebody and say, "Thus saith the Lord." It is a terrible and dangerous and a frightening thing to say unto someone, Thus saith the Lord. But that is indeed what the prophets did. They spoke into the world and said, The Lord says to you, If you don't do this, then this is going to happen. And to the extent that that, I guess, is foretelling the truth, that makes my mama a prophet. Right? Because you keep doing that, and this is what you're going to get. Right? Yeah, you know, your mama's ever done that? Gra grandmama sent you to go get your own switch? Yeah. Prophets speak forth the Word of God into the world. They say the hard things. And as such... They have always suffered. It's not a good thing. Well, it is a very good thing, but it's not an easy thing to be a prophet of the Lord. If you look at the two New Testament scriptures that we read this morning, both of them speak about Israel, O Israel, you have killed the prophets. You have torn down the altars. You have not submitted to the Word of God. You, you haven't done that. You've rebelled. That is what the writer in Matthew, Paul in his letter to the Romans, is saying. Is you, haven't, you haven't listened. Not only have you not listened, you've attacked those people I sent to you to bring a word to speak to you and say, you need a change. Why? Why have they done that? Because at some base level, when God speaks into our life and challenges us to change something, maybe fundamental to our very nature, something we don't want to let go of, when it really strikes at the very core of who we are, when it makes us do something that we don't want to do, we resist it and the person that's saying it. We resist the messenger as much as the message because we displace our anger and frustration at what we're having to deal with on to the person that's bringing the message, right? 
And you can see that if you've ever been around teenagers. <laughs> right? The, or you've been one. Right? Like Laura says, I still remember being one. Right? I've been a teenager. You have to. We didn't just skip years. Right? Has anybody ever told you you needed to change something about you and it just made you mad? Right? You know, that part of you right there is just not right and you need to change that. I don't want to. Right? We, we reject the Word and the person. Have you ever been around somebody that was annoyingly always right? Amen. <laughs> See people elbowing their spouses, right? <laughs> right 99.9% .9 of the time? I bet you're right 99% of the time. You? Yeah? Are you not right? No, maybe not. Okay. Not so much, huh? You don't know about that one. People of Israel chose to go their own way more than once. And it never ended good. And they got in these cycles of just falling in the judges' cycle. Multiple, multiple times. They went their own way, they worshipped other gods, and then they fell. When they hit the wall and things were bad, they remembered God. And it's the same for us. We remember God when bad things happen. We, we come running home. We come quickly to realize, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, what have I done? What's going on with me? What? Oh my goodness. I have to come back home. And I end up coming back to God. Sociologists and human, uh, human sociologists and people that study the nature of humans in large numbers, meaning group dynamics, will tell you that that is a pendulum. And it is a, they chart it out, it is a societal pendulum that's true throughout most of Western civilization, even back to the ancient days. This pendulum of the swing. What if we could short-circuit it? What, what if we could cut that off? What if we could get to the place where we don't have to take the wild, crazy swing this way to get back to God? What if we could tap into a power that is amazing in pointing us to the truth right now without all the baggage of having to deal with it? with an obnoxious person, right? Because people that are right are obnoxious, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pick on Alabama, right? Alabama, no, no, no. Alabama is the most winning program in the last 20 years in college football, right? Winning this program. How many people hated Saban because of it? All of them, All of them <laughs> right? Right? Why? Because he, he was right. You ever see him give a talk on motivation? You ever see him give a talk on all of these, just how to do it in the Alabama way and all this stuff? And you, he, he was annoying. People didn't like him because he was right most of the time. So here's the thing. We as humans have something called pride and we struggle to submit Right? We have trouble submitting to, to prophets because they're usually the ones pointing the other direction from the, the way the herd is running. That's why they get trampled. So what if we could short-circuit that? By having a prophet that no one could get mad at. Well, except the people that were around him at the moment. 
that were the power structures threatened by him. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe people do get mad at him. But for me, individually, one-on-one, -on -one, he gives me a road map. What if there was this one prophet that would willingly go to be killed and die so that he could speak forth into our world a prophetic message of what God's will was for me and you and take the lumps and get killed just like the prophets before but but being different in that he can rise up that they can kill him but they can't silence him they can take him out but he'll rise up again on the third day they may strike him down but he'll leap up on high as the words of the great song, Lord of the Dance, sing. What if we could have a great prophet who is a great prophet? Who speaks into the world in powerful ways. What if we did and his name was Jesus? You see, he claimed the authority to be the chief prophet. The chief prophet. Who does not foretell the future, but speaks forth into our world to foretell the truth of God in every situation. When he says it was finished, he had completed all the prophecies. He had fulfilled them, and he had completed making them. He had laid out the truth of God. He had fulfilled the office of prophet, of priest, and king. Or in other words, he was all that in a bag of chips. The best that ever was, the most amazing, the most incredible, that spoke truth. The prophets were humans in the Old Testament. You see even Elijah here calls out the priests of Baal. Man, he does it in a big way, doesn't he? You get 450 of them. And they're praying for that fire to fall and it doesn't fall. And he, look, he gets in their face. Hey, why don't you yell louder? Maybe he's on vacation. Why don't you yell louder? Maybe he's asleep. Man, he's not just calling them out. He's trolling them. You know what trolling is? Like, he, he's talking smack. Is that, do people say that anymore? I mean, he is, he is, he is, he is in their face about it, right? Trash talking them. And then he has, like, he goes above and beyond. He has them bring water and pour on his. He's that confident in God. Now, he, there's a whole backstory, and I really wanted to read all of it, but we got to get out of here for Sunday school. Um, but there's a whole backstory with Jezebel and Ahab and all of that. It's, you need to go back and read it. Go back and read the chapters before this and see all of the junk that he's dealing with. And he just totally destroys them, brings them down to the river, and slaughters the 450 prophets. Slaughtered? Yeah. Why? Because they were tearing down the people of God. His chosen one. Leading them astray. I often think about folks that are leading folks astray today, particularly children. And you'd think I would burn with anger about that. But all I can think is, dear Lord, May He have mercy on their souls. 
because I would dread to be that person in the hands of an angry God. I can't imagine the fullness of God's wrath poured out on me individually. But so it will be for all that reject Him, that turn their back on the Lord. I, I know that's not loving. I, I know that's fairly harsh. And in today's sensibilities, that sounds... A little hard and a little difficult. I don't even know how to say it. But I have to tell you the truth. That we all face a choice. Just like in this passage. He brought the people of Israel and said, you know, pick who you're going to... Often in their history, just... Joshua did it. He did it. Often in their history, the people of Israel was told, figure out who you're going to serve and pick one side. Or as my daddy would say, pick which side the fence you're going to fall off on. <laughs> right? Fish or cut bait. I can't say the other thing he used to say. <laughs> right? Pick and choose. And the people just stood there and said, uh, 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 I don't know. Sound like my children trying to figure out where we're going to go eat. Uh, uh, I don't know. Choose. Pick a side. There are two sides, there are two ways. There are two paths. And one leads to destruction. And one leads to life and hope. Everyone must face that choice. Who will you serve? It is the truth spoken by all of the prophets. It is the truth foretold, forth told by Jesus Christ Himself. Pick. Pick. God so wants you to pick Him. He so wants you to choose Him. Not because He needs anything, but because He wants you. If you're watching right now on the internet, I beg with you, reach out to us or any good Bible-believing church. Find a pastor. Find an excited layperson and sit down with them and talk to them. And make a choice whom you will serve. And the choice is life or death. The choice is left or right. The choice is up or down. It's simple. Won't you choose life and hope? Look, it's not going to be easy, even for a prophet. Even somebody filled with the Holy Spirit, right? It's hard. Even Elijah despaired for his life and said, Lord, take me out now. Just take me home. I can't do this anymore. I just can't. Have you ever been in a place where you just said, I just can't do this no more? Look at somebody and go, I can't, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it no more. Right? You've been there. So I'm going to close with this. What does he tell him to do? There, he tells him to lay down and take a nap. I believe taking naps is biblical. Let me just say that. I believe naps are... I, you laugh. Keep on laughing. I ain't kidding this time. I'm being serious. Or serious. I'm being serious. I believe naps are biblical. Because sometimes you just need to rest your mind. You need to rest your body. I once heard a pastor, 
Um, I don't agree with him on most things. His name's John Hagee. But he said sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap to let God heal you. But secondly, the main thing he told him to do was what? Arise and eat. Look at somebody say, get up, meat. Get up and eat. Come eat. Come eat. Because you need to take a little, little bread and a little water for your body. And he did, and what God had provided for him, he journeyed in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Wow, that's some good bread. Arise and eat. And God's word to you today is if you're feeling like that, if you're feeling like you're at the bottom end of the trench, if you feel like you're stretched thin to the very end, if you're tired of this world, if you listen to the news and you think, oh Lord, God, just take me now. If your heart is beating inside your chest like it'll explode most of the time when you hear things going on, frustrated, maybe you can't make the ends meet, maybe you stretch that dollar till it screams, maybe you can't deal with your children or grandchildren or your parents anymore you're just stressed out you got everything going on you're juggling eighteen thousand plates and you just don't know what in the name of the lord you're going to do take a nap and come eat now don't do it during the middle of my sermon but take a nap and come eat the table is prepared for you just as Jesus is the great prophet, he's the chief prophet, he also prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our head with oil and our cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.